We got Amber Furman coming on here in just a bit. She is going to just empower you to create the best life ever, specifically to have the courage to do it, to have the courage to step into who you really are, own that, and show up and serve people in the process and live an extraordinary life. So stick around because we're going to be introducing her in just a second. Before that, though, thank you for being here. Thank you for choosing to be your greatest possible self, for taking one step at a time on this journey. That's how we accomplish anything, everything we desire, everything we set our heart, our mind, and our soul to. It's through focus, patience, and persistence. And remember that you already have everything that you need within you. So just love yourself even more. Appreciate everything that you have, everything that you are, uh, and just like really bring that love to yourself. I think that's what the world needs most right now is for each of us to to have patience and grace and and love ourselves and, and whatever is coming through and flowing through us, like to really love that. Okay. So I'm gonna read Amber's intro in just a second here. Before that, grab a piece of paper, grab a pen, be ready to take notes. This is gonna be a powerful interview uh, for you. This woman is doing some big, big things and uh, empowering a lot of people. So. Amber lives in Las Vegas, where she owns and operates her own law firm, Furman Law. She practices criminal defense and immigration law, focusing on where the two areas of law intersect. After law school, Amber became fascinated with the way the mind works, learning about limiting beliefs and the things that we set on ourselves and the way our words and thoughts affect our actions. She's a certified master practitioner of neuro-linguistic programming, and Amber is the host of the More Than Corporate podcast, which focuses on finding fulfillment and defining success. Amber and her guests on the podcast share their stories of defining their own idea of success, getting outside of their comfort zones, failing, and getting back up to chase their dreams, and the role authenticity plays in fulfillment. Amber's dedicated to using her journey to help others in their quest for fulfillment through coaching and speaking. And we are blessed to have this beautiful soul with us. Amber, are you ready to bring the heat, Superwoman? Of course. What's going on, man? How are you? Oh, I am just rocking today. It is the 12-hour minute. It's, it's like it's GPS day, Amber. We're bringing it. We are it's bringing It's GPS day. <laughs> what else I can you it. ask for? I love it. I love it. I'm, I'm going to go submit something to get uh, you know National GPS Day, like uh, some kind of announcement, government announcement for it. Uh, but before we dive into that rabbit hole, let's talk about your message to millions. That's the theme of today, Amber. What does that mean for you? Message to millions. Um, for me, it honestly goes back to one of the most powerful moments in my life where somebody asked me for the first time what success meant to me. Mm -hmm. And the reason that this was so powerful is because I had everything that somebody would look at and think of success. I had the law degree. I had everything that I, or I had the, we won't say everything. I had the, the income that I thought I wanted. I had the degree I thought I wanted. I had the job I thought I wanted. And I was miserable. Mm -hmm. And I remember telling somebody, I don't feel successful. And they said, well, what does success mean to you? And I realized that I was in my mid-30s and nobody had ever asked me that question before. And that kind of led me down this rabbit hole, which you know as well as I do, that we don't really understand the power of certain moments until we're well past them and have yeah. a chance to reflect. Mm -hmm. So it took about four years before I realized how powerful that moment really was for me. Mm -hmm. um, but it really set me down a rabbit hole of just defining my life and taking it back and starting to live for the first time. So my message to millions is just like, own yourself, be authentic with who you are and have the power to understand and listen to yourself and then have the courage to go out there and say, screw my fears. Mm. We're just, we're going to go take on the world. Oh, oh, oh. with courage, <laughs> with, with, like with audacity, courage. you know, like playing at such a big level and knowing that you deserve it, knowing that you deserve whatever you want. Cause I think it can be heartbreaking, um, and, 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 um, kind of disempowering when we find out we put our faith into a cookie or money or some kind of reward that is not actually fulfilling. And it's like, oh, I spent all this time and this energy thinking that it was something was important. And then to only find out like, oh, what a waste of time. But then we also get to leverage that looking back, like you said, as fuel, as purpose, as like the reason why we get to keep moving forward and, and then serve other people with what we've learned along the journey. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that one of the biggest things that you hit on there that people need to 
take from that is just to give yourself permission to be fluid. Because mm-hmm. I know that was one of my biggest concerns when I started questioning mm-hmm. whether I was where I wanted to be. My entire identity was wrapped up in being an attorney. Wow. I didn't know how to be anything else. And um, to the point where I would, I used to make a joke that law school ruined my life because I would say that people would say, what do you like to do for fun? And I'm like, I lost the idea of fun when I decided to go to law school. Like, I don't know what I like to do in my spare time. And I didn't realize how much that was a sign that my entire identity was wrapped up in being an attorney Mm -hmm. until I started thinking maybe that wasn't everything that I wanted to be. And the incongruency and panic attacks and just struggles that come along with changing your identity are painful, but so worth it. Wow. Oh my gosh. Okay. So let's go back into your journey and then we'll, we'll dive into all the great work that you're doing today. Um, but first, what got you into law? Why did you choose to go to law in the first place? Last so time? I've probably had three or four different answers to that. Um, and I don't know that I actually know the real mm-hmm. answer. I can tell you that um, I felt lost. So I've always loved the law. Um, I, in John Grisham world, like maybe not the real law, but like John Grisham's idea of what the law is. And I always knew that I was going to be successful and that schooling was a part of my future. I'm the first person in my family to go to college. And I always knew that that was going to be like, I can't think of a time in my childhood where college was not in my plans. But then I got there and, um, I enrolled in a computer programming degree Um, my dad suggested I go to law school and I was like, I don't want to do that. Like, um, I like people and uh, people don't like attorneys and I want (laughs) friends. And so we're not going to go down that road. Um, and then my first year of college, my dad was in an accident. Um, and unfortunately he didn't make it. So I spent the next five, six years just kind of trying to figure out what life was supposed to be in a time where you're trying to figure out who you are as an adult, my entire world was ripped apart. And so, but the only thing I held on to is I go to school. Like that's Mm. all that I had held on to. So I sat there and I failed classes over and over and over again because I wouldn't withdraw from school and I didn't know what I wanted to do. And finally, I just got this wake up call where I was like, this is not the life I want to be living. Mm. What am I interested in? And a friend of mine invited me to a constitutional law class I went and I never looked back and decided I was going to apply for law school. So I turned my grades around. Um, I think at the time I had my wake up call, by the way, was a letter from Idaho State's financial aid saying that you can no longer go to school because your GPA is too low. I had like a 1.3 GPA at one point in time in college. And so I turned my GPA around. I graduated from college. I went to law school, graduated in the top 3% of my class in law school, and then came here and just I mean, it was what I needed to turn my life around. What, what do you feel would have made the biggest difference for you in that period where like you were just failing and like you, you didn't know how to apply yourself or you, you just like, what, what was missing there that would have made the difference? So I don't know if anything would have, if that mm-hmm. makes sense. I feel like this is the journey that I was supposed to live. Yeah. Um, I Embracing authenticity mm-hmm. was what saved my life when I was struggling and went to see my therapist and she told me about Brene Brown and authenticity and and that really turned me around and so I think maybe having that kind of an environment earlier like Mm. being being told that it's okay to be you being told that you don't need to fill in any expectations that it's okay to listen to what you want that that what you are is enough right now. And then you get to, because there's a fine line between wanting to improve yourself and wanting to change yourself. Mm. And so in order for us to maintain our sanity and still grow, we have to walk that line in a way that we accept who we are. We love who we are. And yet we still have things that we know we can be doing better at. Mm. And so it's that acceptance and that growth at the same time. And I wish I would have learned that earlier. Wow. Wow. Powerful. So you graduate law school and what was early on in your law career like? So I actually, um, my entire law school career, I planned to work in the public defender's office. It's all I ever wanted to do was be a public defender. So I started researching public defender spots for my internship and Vegas was high on the map. Um, as far as stats go, at least way back in 
what, 2012, when I was looking, um, they had the best, one of the best public defenders office in the nation. Mm -hmm. So I um, applied for an internship. I got that at the Clark County Public Defender's Office. And I hadn't really planned for a contingency plan. Mm -hmm. Um, In my mind, it was just, you're going to be a public defender. So I did my internship, took the bar, passed, and then bombed my interviews um, at the public (laughs) defender's office. So um, I made it, like my internship got me through so much, but the reality is I didn't have the confidence that I needed to be good at that job. And um, I can blame it on a ton of things. I can blame it on the fact that it was 2013 and we were in a hiring freeze and the economy sucked in Nevada. But the reality is I didn't have the confidence to do the job. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, I've got to pay the bills somehow. And at this point in time, my entire ego is tied into being an attorney. So God forbid that I actually do anything else to pay the bills. So I found this um, law firm that was looking for a law clerk, and it was in immigration law. And I remember going to this interview, getting the job, and then sitting in my car and crying because I didn't want to do immigration. I wanted nothing to do with it. Like I was supposed to be a public defender. Um, And I went through that for about the first year that um, I practiced. Um, I wasn't all in. I was one foot in, one foot out in my public defender or in the um, immigration job. And then I kept reapplying to the public defender's office. And um, my third time around at the public defender's office, as far as applying is concerned, I got a notice from my boss at the immigration job that he was going to send me to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in San Francisco to argue. Um, And that was the first time that I realized that I had this opportunity in front of me that was going to give me experiences that I would never have at the public defender's office. And so I also knew that the public defender's office here in Nevada is so competitive that if you get a job offer and turn it down, you may never get another one. So I withdrew my application on my third time, withdrew my application, went to the argument at the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. And um, I've been doing immigration ever since. I tried to outrun it for about two and a half years, but it has followed me. So (laughs) I own it at this point. (laughs) I love it. I love it. It's so so cool. Like your radical authenticity with like, hey, you know, like like I I tried to escape this this thing, but it's (laughs) it's like it's it's who I am at some level, and it's what I'm meant to be doing at this phase in my life, and how I'm serving people, and and like you started up your own own. uh, law office, right? Or, or uh, not office, but um, practice. Yeah, yeah, I did. And that was, again, out of necessity. Um, I felt mm-hmm. like, so I practiced immigration law for two and a half years. Mm-hmm. And then I really missed that criminal defense experience. I just felt like I still needed some of that. So I went to a law firm that does um, criminal defense here in Las Vegas. And mm-hmm. I got a lot of great experience over two and a half years, did some jury trials, was able to really get that every single day in court experience that I thought I wanted. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of where my story starts as far as where I am now, because it was during that job that I started to um, kind of unravel. Like this was everything I thought I wanted in court every day, representing clients in front of a jury. This was what six figure income. This is what was supposed to make me happy. So why did I feel so empty inside? And I didn't realize that I felt empty until I was traveling for work and started having panic attacks um, because I was out of everything that I knew. I I had nothing comfortable around me and something happened and I was left to my own devices. And that's when I realized how truly weak I was mentally. Mm -hmm. Um, And so at that point in time, I really started to think about my options. That was in March of 2016. Mm -hmm. And in um, 2017, in September, I put in my notice at my firm and I was going to quit practicing law. I was like, this isn't what I want. I can't do this. And somebody encouraged me to open my own firm and have control over the clients that I take and the way that my future goes and be able to take ownership of my life And I was at a point in my life at that point in time where I had nothing to lose. So I did. And it was the best decision of my life. Wow. What, what do you feel created success early on for you um, as an entrepreneur, like, you know, managing yourself and building your own company? So as far as, um, as far as 
the business side of it, it is definitely the people that were around me. Mm. Um, I, the, the individual who convinced me that I could open my own firm is my, is my landlord that I rent my office from. Wow. And they made sure that I didn't fail. They, they were not about to let me fail. Wow. And they didn't, like, it's not even that I, you know, like when a kid's learning to walk and they like have to hold on to their parent's hand, but they really don't need them. Their dad's not, their dad's not doing anything. Right. But the moment they let go, they feel like they're going to fall. Mm -hmm. Like, that's what this was. I never really needed their help. Um, I needed their support. I needed somebody to believe in me more than I believed in myself. And that's what they were there for. Um, so definitely the people that I surrounded myself with but in between March of 2016 and September of 2017, when I put in my notice, a lot of stuff happened that increased my mental toughness. Mm. And it was honestly just finally having a belief that I was capable of more than I thought I was. And then having people around me who could feed that when I couldn't feed it myself. Mm. Mm. I know you do um, obstacle courses. I'm curious, yeah. like, when did you, like, was there a moment where you declared war on the weakness in your mind and like you've started building out like all right i'm gonna attack this point i'm gonna attack this point i'm gonna, like building a case of attack like you know how did how did you uh unfold in that way so without knowing it yes um and that stuff in between those two points that i talked about between march 2016 and 2017 was obstacle course racing. Mm -hmm. And basically I had, I had wanted to do, I grew up in Idaho. I grew up in a farm. I grew up playing in the mud and I, let me say property. We didn't have a farm. I had horses, but I grew up playing in the mud. And so this idea of obstacle course racing, I was like, dude, I can do that. Like that yeah. was my childhood. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and so I spent some time working out with some friends. Fitness got me out of this funk that I was in. Mm. And I met an obstacle course trainer and he was like, dude, come train with me. And prior to this, I had bought all these obstacle course tickets and then I would never go. And that wow. money was just wasted. I would, con I would convince myself out of it. So I ran my first obstacle course race in September of 2016. And then in November of 2016, I was pit crew for my trainer for the World's Toughest Mudder. And World's Toughest Mudder, for those of you who don't know, is a 24-hour obstacle course race where it's a five-mile loop with 20 obstacles per loop, and you run that as many times as you can in 24 hours without stopping. Um, and I watched the people that were doing this, and they were like, they took away all my excuses for wow. everything in life. Wow. I was watching amputees. I was watching people who were blind, legally blind, running it with a guide. I was watching veterans that had seizures and were running with their dog because their dog could alert medical of their seizures. Like everything that would ever tell me I'm not strong enough to do this, there was somebody there taking that away. And I was seeing people that were elite athletes and then people that were weekend warriors like myself. And I remember saying in that moment, like, I'm going to run this next year. Dang. And I said it out loud to the wrong person. Be <laughs> who you pick as your accountability partner because they might make you do it. Oh so <laughs> 2017 was my training year. Mm -hmm. um, I ran 17 Tough Mudders in 2017 all around the country. Jesus. I would jump on a plane on Friday go to a course, run one to two laps on Saturday. So that's between 12 and 24 miles on Saturday, run another lap on Sunday, get on a plane, come back and be back to work on Monday. And I did that 17 times in 2017. Um, and then ran World Stuff a Smutter um, here in Vegas. And that experience gets me through so much and got me through my law office because when you realize that you are the person that ran for 24 hours, traveled at a very slow speed, but I use ran right. for 24 hours right, right. <laughs> in the Vegas desert um, and did these obstacles and finished something that you didn't believe you could do. And there are a ton of moments in between all of those races where I wanted to quit, where um, I didn't think I could do something else. Um, there are a couple that really stick out that impacted me that I rely on when I'm feeling weak, but my tough mutter headbands sit around my house. And that moment that you're having your pity party or that you're feeling like you can't do it. Even three years later, those headbands go on my head and it's like instant power. Damn. Damn. So I'm curious, what would you recommend around tough mutters and people who haven't done an obstacle course yet? 
involve yourself in a community. There are a ton of online communities that have people from all around the world in them. So decide which race you want to be a part of. I guess now Spartan and Tough Mudder are kind of all the same, but, um, and then, and then find people in your area that will train because what I find is that no matter what part of the obstacle course racing community that you're in, People are so supportive. The races themselves are different. Spartan's more individual, more time oriented, where Tough Mudder is more community based and helping people around you oriented. So I always recommend Tough Mudder for that reason. Yeah. Um, but find somebody that you can train with because I promise you they're there. But beware that once you insert that yourself in that community, it is a lifetime admission. Like you never get to leave. <laughs> and those people are crazy. So if you ever start thinking that you're going to get to slack off again ever in your life, they will make sure that doesn't happen. <laughs> oh my gosh. I love it. I love it. This is so, so powerful because I think a lot of people want to know how do I achieve any goal that I set my mind to? You know, how do I, how do I live my dream life? And I think it's the, um, I don't know if it's the right word, but circuitous path, like it's the roundabout way. It's like the trying different things in the periphery and things like martial arts, things like, like optical courses, like these things that may not initially, we, we, we can't like say, oh, because I do this, then I'm going to get to that dream. But like when we're trying things and, and disciplining ourselves and pushing ourselves outside of our comfort zone, going to improv classes, like whatever it might be, right? Like yeah. when we're trying these things in the periphery, like so many things open up that we never could have planned before. And it like, just like helps us thrive. Yeah. I always say that it is impossible because of the way that our minds work to push yourself out of your comfort zone in one area of your life mm -hmm. and not have it impact everything that you do. Mm -hmm. So I can't push myself out of my comfort zone in a physical world in fitness and not have it impact my um, my work or That's relationships right. or whatever I'm doing, because when I got on that course and every single time I got there, I did something I couldn't do before. It might've mm -hmm. been an obstacle. Maybe I ran more, maybe, you know, instead of the first time I did two laps, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. Um, next time you're in a situation where you, um, think that you're not strong enough, those experiences come back to remind you that you are. And we had a saying that was set at the start line by Sean Corvell at every Tough Mudder race that I ran in 2017. And it was, when was the last time you did something for the first time? Wow. And I ask myself that constantly. If you can't answer that question, when was the last time I did something for the first time, then you are living in your comfort zone and you need to get out. Whether it's something small, like you don't have to be jumping out of planes, you don't like help, help a, a old lady take her groceries out to her car if you've never done that before. Call a friend, take them, you know, whatever it is. Something that makes you just a little bit uncomfortable. Um, and be able to stay when somebody says, when was the last time you did something for the first time? Be able to answer that question. So good. So good, Amber. This is gold. Okay, so you you started like really discovering about the mind and being curious about that and studying the mind. Tell us about like when like when did that become a, a conscious decision and like what did you discover along the way? So a really good friend of mine, um, which you'll find I guess is a theme of all of this, is really good friends that put me in situations that I would never go to by myself. Um, she took me to this success boot camp. Um, and this was just a few months after I had started my office and I expected to walk into this room and have somebody tell me like, here's steps one through five to a million dollars, like right. now go. Yeah. And instead what I heard was like, you're the reason that you're not successful. Mm. Like your mindset is what's holding you back. Mm. And I, I had interest. So going back just a little bit to when I was in college and I was bouncing around, I did some psychology classes. I had, I wanted to be a forensic profiler for a little bit. Um, and like criminal mind style. Um, so I have this, I've always had this fascination with the way the mind works. And when she said that to me, I was super intrigued with how this could be. And so I, um, agreed to give it a shot and went to um, neuro linguistic brain programming NLP. Um, and I went to that first class and it was four days and that changed my life. And I, I was in 100% after that. Um, and that's when you really kind of start to learn that 
you are in 100% control of what happens to you. And when you acknowledge that, it is painful and powerful at the same time, but it's mm-hmm. such an important realization to make. So, so good. So you said, okay, I, I'm at the source of my reality of whatever I create and the reason why I have or don't have the things that I have in my life or don't have in my life. Um, <laughs> Let's talk about starting the podcast and when, like, what was the, the like, I got to share this with the world. I got to build a platform. I got to reach more people. Like, what was the cause of that? So going back to 2016, I'm sitting up in Reno. Um, I'm away for work. I've got court appearances up there and I've always been really good at compartmentalizing. Mm-hmm. So I was having panic attacks and anxiety attacks, but I had a job to do. So I would pull myself together go do my job. And then I would get back to the hotel and I would fall apart and I would try to eat and I couldn't eat and I couldn't sleep. And in that moment, for the first time I called a therapist. Now my dad had died 15 years before and I've never sought therapy. So this is the first time that I've talked to anybody about my emotions from 15 years of losing my dad and a bunch of loss before that. And this is where I found authenticity and This is where I really started to understand my emotions and start to lay the groundwork for everything. So about a year and a half, maybe two years into that process, um, I felt like I needed to start sharing my story. I felt like I had come far enough that I had something to tell people. And I had never really experienced the podcast world, so I was going to do it in a blog. And I created my first blog post where I talked about this experience and what it was like for me. And at this point in time, my identity is still 100% tied up into being an attorney. I haven't found NLP yet. And so the idea of doing something that puts my legal career at risk was terrifying to me. So I wrote this blog post about my feelings and I know that I have friends in the legal community that were going to read it. And I remembered thinking, am I going to put my name on this? Mm -hmm. And I shared it with a friend of mine and he asked me the same thing, Amber, this could ruin your law office. Nobody wants an attorney that feels like this. Mm -hmm. And I struggled with it and I actually wrote it anonymously. And then Well, I went to post it and just something hit me. And I said, if authenticity really changed my life, and if I am trying to portray to people that you need to be courageous and you need to go out there and tell your story and change the world, then I cannot post this anonymously. So I either put my name on it or I don't post it at all. And I posted it with my name and I got amazing feedback from people inside the community and outside of the legal community. Um, But I wasn't ready. And I didn't want to write a blog. Like I write all day for a living. I didn't want to write a blog. And so fast forward about another year um, to the middle of 2019. At this point, I found NLP. I'm halfway through that training. And I connected with some people in the podcasting world. And I just felt like being able to talk to people and interview people and show my authenticity and share my story and do all of that in a verbal setting was where... I was meant to be. And so I started my podcast in August of 2019. I love it. Congratulations on that, by the way. It's, it's huge. And I know you like just hit your six month mark and you're like, oh my gosh, like I can't believe the downloads I'm getting yeah. and just the people I'm impacting. It's, it's so beautiful when you, when you really see the, the difference that you're making and people continuing to tune in and get value from, from what we put out, you know? Yeah. I mean, sometimes, I mean, you know, we, we do this and we just wonder whether we're talking to ourselves sometimes or whether anybody's listening. And so, um, you know, I never necessarily want to be that person that has multi-million dollar or multi-million followers. Now I'm not saying I won't end up there. I'm just saying right now, that's not a dream of mine. Um, if there's one person that I'm impacting, then that's enough for me to keep going. So good. So good. So when did, or not when, but like, what do you want our audience to know about uh, defining that best life, the vision for our life to, to really step into, um, and especially on your journey, like defining your life and what you want to create? How, did, how does that relate? Because that's really what we want to dive into, the best life, creating that. Where do we want to yeah. start with that, Amber? So I mentioned um, a little bit in the beginning, but now that you've heard some more of my story, like sitting in my therapist's office, telling her how unsuccessful I felt and having her ask me, well, what does success mean to you? And realizing that's the first time that anybody has ever asked me that question. So that was before I 
found out about NLP. Now I know through my NLP training that our brains are incapable of accomplishing something that you cannot define. Mm. So if you are unable to define what a good life means for you, what success means for you, what fulfillment means for you, what freedom means to you, if you cannot define those for yourself, then you're never going to have them because your brain's constantly going to be searching for what that means. Yep. You have to give it clear guidelines of what success means to you. Now that's not permanent, that can change, but you have to define right now what a success means to me. What does fulfillment mean? What does freedom mean? Once you sit down and map out the life that you want, mm -hmm. then you can, it's so easy to go get it. It's that we spend so much time circling around because we're doing what our parents want us to do, or we're doing what society wants us to do, or we think we're doing what we want to do, but we've never asked ourselves what that is. So how do we know? Mm. And we just go around in circles. And then one day you wake up and it's normally whatever rock bottom is for you at this moment yeah. in time yeah. that makes you realize that you've worked your ass off for something that makes you unhappy. Mm. And Changing that is difficult, but so important. So that's why this idea of defining your life is so important to me. Um, you, you have to. And in the NLP world, we don't use the word half very often because normally it's you get to. But you have to define your life if you want to be able to live it. So good. I love it. It's like we're, we're given this mental machinery, like high performance NASCAR, you know, rocket ship <laughs> style, like capacity um, device and mechanism. And it's like so many people do not put it to good use. They don't focus on something that's going to move the needle in their life and, and like really create that clarity of the end destination first. And it's like, like really mechanical, right? It's very scientific. It's very not, you don't, you don't need to be woo woo to, to create this dream vision of your life. It's really important just to check in what's, what's valuable, what's important to me and to set a target, set a destination so that your, your conscious mind and unconscious mind can be, begin working on that and begin like creating opportunities and attracting people into our lives that can help us to achieve that thing. Yeah, 100%. One of my favorite um, things is Simon Sinek's TED Talk on the power of why yeah. um, and like his three levels of why. And it talks, it talks about it in the business sense, but in all reality, it applies into everything that you do. Mm. And if something I've, I've learned that if something makes you, if you want something, if you think it's going to make you happy, trying to figure out what it is about that, that actually intrigues you, mm. what is it that you're going after? Um, because it's not always what you think it is. The law degree that I wanted wasn't about law. It was about feeling worthy of having things, you know, like there, there's a ton of reasons that you could want something. And I remember being at an event in November of last year in Delaware. And one of the speakers said, um, we should stop focusing on what job we want to have and start focusing on the life that we want to live and figure out what gets us there. And that was the first time that I had ever looked at this thing as like an end, um, an end goal and then working backwards to figure out there could be a hundred paths that get you to the life that you want. Mm. But if you don't know, I mean, you're, you're basically sitting in a rowboat rowing blind, just hoping you don't hit an iceberg. Yeah. And it's so funny as you're saying that, like what, what came to my mind is, I think a lot of times people know we're supposed to have some kind of goal, right? Like, I think that's like a life wisdom, like go for some, for something, right? But like really starting with the true end in mind versus the shiny object in mind, the $10,000 a month, $100,000 a year, whatever it might be, you know, like living in the nice house or having the, the dream man or dream woman. It's almost like the, um, I, I think about process and goals, process and outcomes. I think a lot of people don't focus enough on the process on like the day to day stuff and like what are the actions that need to be done to get to the goal. But then when defining the end goal, they also they they do it on things that are like not really that important to them. It's it's shallow. It's just like because like you said, they've been taught to do that from society or parents or whatever it might be. And they're not really connected with it. So it's like it's almost like it's it's hidden in plain view. We're told to do it, but it's just we're not we're, we, we don't have the wisdom to discern where do I focus on my goals? Is it just to like have a great job? Is it to you know do what people are telling me to do and focus there and drive there? Or is it something that I'm really connected to and something that really is meaningful to me? 
Yeah. And honestly, like one of the most powerful things is when you understand the way that the mind works, because mm -hmm. we have our conscious mind and our unconscious mind mm -hmm. and your conscious mind runs about 10% of your life and thinks it runs everything. And your unconscious mind is there running in the background and runs 90% of everything that we do. Mm -hmm. And that holds all of the limiting beliefs. It remembers everything. So everything that's ever been said to you, um, that time that somebody told you that, you know, you weren't strong enough or, and, and it could have been like, you're not, you're, you're three years old and you're not strong enough to pick up a huge box. Like right. they weren't wrong, but your mind interprets that. And 30 years down the road, when you want to accomplish something, you've got this limiting belief that was created when you were three years old, when somebody told you that you weren't strong enough to do something mm. like it's the, it's not always the traumatic experiences that we hear about that impact what we experience as an adult. It's every innocent comment that's ever been said to us. Mm. And we just never know what's going to land in what way. This is where coaches come in so important because you have your unconscious mind that you're listening to. That's what you're aware of. Unless you have some of this training, you don't even know that the other 90% is there yet. Every, you can think you're making decisions consciously, but you're not running your life. Your unconscious mind is running your life and you need somebody that can get past your conscious mind, talk to your unconscious mind and help you understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. I know. Like you've even gone through breakthrough processes yourself that like made such a ma massive different difference for you. It's like being a product of the product, you know, and like being able to share this stuff that you've learned and you've experienced firsthand that have made such a big impact in your life. I think is so powerful. Yeah, the breakthrough process is something that you can't really describe unless somebody's been through it because you wouldn't believe me, anyways. Um, but it's a pretty freaking powerful experience. Thing. So you you have the podcast now. You're sharing great positive, inspirational messages. You have your your law firm and um like your law practice and like what what do you see in the vision as as this evolves? As you have these tools, as you have this platform, you have your business. Like what's important to you this this upcoming year? Like that that you are excited to be building towards and um tell us about that. Yeah. So again, be careful what you ask for, um, because I had been wanting to take my law firm virtual for a while and I've been putting that off and, um, <laughs> then coronavirus happened. Yeah. So my law firm is now virtual. <laughs> um, and, um, I'm, I see this kind of, um, collaboration between running my law firm maybe having an associate to help when I'm gone, but I never wanted to have that big law firm and I still don't. Mm -hmm. um, but having my law firm, I love the area where immigration and criminal law intersect. I love analyzing crimes for deportation consequences. I love being involved in that analysis and I will never leave that behind. Mm -hmm. So I have my law firm where I represent clients. I have a consulting side of my business where I work with criminal defense attorneys mm -hmm. who are representing non-citizens to help them structure plea deals. Um, so I can do that from anywhere. I also am starting a coaching business. I have my podcast. I'm starting speaking. So um, like I'm writing a book, two of them, a legal book and a personal book. So um, I have a little bit going on. Not a lot, just a little bit. I think I have some more room for other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> more more obstacle courses too. You didn't you yeah. didn't mention that. <laughs> no, so um I 2018 I focused on my mindset. Yeah. And 2000 and, or on my business. 2019 I focused on my mindset. This year was supposed to be the year I got really back into fitness and obstacle course racing. Um I have a small little problem with balance. Mm. So it's a matter of like I find something and I latch onto it and that <laughs> becomes like my entire focus and it's taken running three businesses for me to be able to pull back on that. Because when you run three businesses, you can't neglect any of them. Mm. I can't run a law firm, run a podcast, run a coaching business and be all in on any of those. Mm. I have to be all in on all of them at the same time. Mm. Um, the best way it was described to me was when somebody said, don't have a plan B, have multiple plan A's. Mm. My law firm, my podcast, and my coaching business and speaking, they are all my plan A's. Mm. Any of those failing is not an option to me. So, um, when you look at it that way, instead of like, this is my plan B because plan B is just give your plan A a reason to fail. Yeah. yeah. Oof. This, this is so good. Um, so courage, I want to talk about courage to face the yeah. things that, that scare us. Like, what do we need to know about that, Amber? So courage, um, fear is an asshole. We'll just mm -hmm. put it that way. Mm -hmm. No. Um, mm -hmm. so we have this like fight or flight 
thing, right? Whatever we want to call it. Um, that's definitely not my forte, but it exists. And, um, so many times we listen to it when we shouldn't. So when it comes to being afraid of doing something, the courage aspect, in my opinion, comes into being able to realistically analyze what your fear is. Mm. And is this fear realis realistic? Um, am I about to go skydiving and am I afraid? And there's some really realistic fears that go along with that. There's also some unrealistic fears that go along with that. And being able to weigh in a level head whether the risk is worth the reward for you. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that anybody should be forced to go out and run obstacle course races or do whatever, you know, whatever it is, just because they think that they're going to get something out of it, unless that thing is something they really want. Mm -hmm. So you have to analyze the reward and analyze why you're doing this before you can figure out whether it's important. Mm -hmm. What I don't want people doing is sitting on their couch or sitting at work or, you know, running whatever you're doing and say, seeing somebody else live their life and saying, I wish I could do that. Because if you wish you can do that, you can, mm. you just have to figure out how, and you have to be willing to fail and you have to have the courage to get back up again. And there's all of that kind of ties in together. But our, one of my favorite quotes is from, um, you're a badass by Jen Sincero. Mm -hmm. And it's actually a screensaver on my computer and on my phone. And it says, um, the walls of my comfort zone are lovingly decorated with a lifetime of my favorite excuses. And this is the first time I had ever thought of my comfort zone as this place that I live where like, there's this world outside that I just have to walk outside and grab and own. But every time I get to that door, there's this lifetime of excuses that I've always told myself, I'm not good enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not you know, pretty enough, whatever it is. And um, they hold me back every time. Mm -hmm. And until I went down this journey, I would just sit in that comfort zone. And it's, it's like this house where you don't know any better. Mm -hmm. And there's this whole world outside for you to live. So good. Like it's, I love how we can physically build a model, like a, a, a brain model that we can understand of like all these excuses plastered on and like see the door, like you were said, like you said, like of, of how we can open up the door and go out and get what we want. But because there's all these excuses that have been there, like it influences us, it influences our subconscious mind. So like I, I know with neurolinguistic programming, it's all about like understanding like, how do we see the world? What's the model of the world that we live yeah. in? Um, how can we picture things and shift and change the picture, shift and change the lens that we view life through and, and like change it to something else, right? So it's like being able to adapt to whatever the program is that's installed and overwrite that to create a new, a new strategy, a new program, a new way of seeing the world. Yeah. And also understanding that the things that mean something to you right now will mean something completely different later. And that applies yeah. to comfort zones as well. You know, I had heard comfort zones for the last four years, yeah. um, even before that, but really the last four years. And I understood that word, but I didn't really understand my comfort zone in like a visual representation until I read that quote. Um, so just being, and then getting ready to write my book, going back on my Facebook timeline and looking at the things that I was posting this time in 2016 and me knowing what I was going through, what emotions I was feeling when I made that Facebook post. And a lot of the things that I'm posting in 2016 are the same as the things I'm posting now. They just have completely different meanings to me because I actually have taken the time to understand what the words mean instead of just sharing and regurgitating somebody else's content. Mm. It's like really meditating on the 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 principle, meditating on the the information. It's like I think when we sit with it, when we look at it from different angles, when we ask ourselves, how does this apply in this situation? How does it imply it in that? When does it not apply? You know, like what does it mean to me? What what impact will it make if I do it in this scenario? And it's like building a um like how we see it, a representation of how we see it from multiple different angles so that we can truly understand, so that we can truly like dig it into the subconscious mind in a good way because it's something that we we want to understand and embody moving forward. Yeah, 100%. And it's not, um, 
you know, never underestimate the power of planting seeds. We've heard mm-hmm. that all, you know, we've all heard a hundred times, but it's so true. Whether we're planting seeds for ourselves or for somebody else, mm-hmm. you're going to say something to somebody or to yourself and it might not latch on for three or four years, yeah. but when it does, it's going to be really powerful for that person. Yeah. Man. Um, in terms of being like a contribution, being of most service to the people around us, uh, what would you rec- recommend right now? Like being a great leader, being like delivering value. What do you think is important today, Amber? So as far as for um, each person, I think this is another thing you have to define. What does service mean to you? What does value mean to you? And what skills do you have that you can help? other people with. And, um, I've heard people say before that my life path didn't, or I didn't find my life path. It found me. Mm -hmm. And I kind of feel like that's 100% true for all of us. If we take the time to really own into that. So finding ways that feel congruent with yourself that you can give that for me, it started, um, in volunteering with, um, legal organizations when I was in law school and then volunteering on Tough Mudder courses and, you know, wherever you are at to provide service to somebody, if you're in already in a service industry, offering um, pro bono services to certain people or um, coaching calls to individuals to be able to give back, whatever that means to you. But it is so important that we give back. It all starts with value in one way or another. Um, And that doesn't mean that you have to bust your butt for free for people. But there is this um, beginning point where you get to show people that you have an enormous amount of value for them. And once they get a glimpse of that, then your um, impact on the world will just explode. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned that relationships are super important for you. What's, What's important about your relationship building today and how you're choosing to surround yourself with people, great people today? Um, so first of all, if you, um, your circle of people that you're with should be constantly motivating you. Um, if you are the person that's constantly motivating the people in your circle, you need to bring some other people into your circle. And that's one of the hardest things I ever had to learn. I don't like to cut people out of my life. I am a people person and I feel like everybody has a spot in my life and they do, but you get to decide where that person goes. Um, As far as relationships are concerned, one of the relationships that has been most impacted by this journey is my relationship with my mom. Mm. And I normally talk about this a little bit in the podcasts that I do, and it's going in my book, but my mom and I have not had a great relationship in the past. Mm. And um, I went through this journey you know, you know, to the point that when my dad died in 2001, my grandma died in 2009. During those eight years, I didn't spend a holiday with my mom. Um, we didn't talk, like we just we weren't close. Um, I went through this last four years of my life and NLP programming and all of this stuff. And this Thanksgiving was the first time that I can ever remember that I spent five days at my mom's house and nobody raised their voice. And we have the best relationship that I could ever ask for in a mother and daughter situation. And what changed was that I quit asking her and everybody around me. I tell this story to illustrate, but it is for everybody around you. I quit asking her to give me things that I should have been giving myself. Quit keeping people in your life because they fulfill you in a way that you should be fulfilling yourself. My mom was never going to be able to give me the love, respect, um, self-worth, that I needed because it needed to come from me. The moment that I quit putting that burden on her and realized that the imperfections that she has are hers and they're not about me and my imperfections are mine and they're not about her. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I owned my own happiness, my own success, my own fulfillment, and I quit asking the people around me to, to bring that to me, my relationship with everybody around me improved. So you can't have that relationship where you are expecting somebody else to make you happy. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's not just a romantic relationship, whether it's coworkers, whether it's mentors, whether it's anybody else, you have to have that for yourself before you can get anything from anyone else. Yeah. hundred percent. What are you studying today to take yourself to the next level, your mindset? Like what's important for you? What, what books or what people, what um, modalities, skill sets, what's important to you today? 
So I'm still in the middle of finishing my NLP training. So I have my master practitioner certification. I'll have my trainer certification this year. I'll also have my master timeline certification, master timeline therapy certification, which will is the breakthroughs and things to that effect this year. Um, I've historically enjoyed books that relate around mindset, but I'm finding myself moving out of that mindset space a little bit because I realized that was my comfort zone mm -hmm. um, and getting into business books. So I just mm -hmm. finished Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss, mm -hmm. which I love so much. Um, moving into more of Darren Hardy's actual like compound effect where there's practical steps there, um, the illusion of money. Mm -hmm. um, so trying to really grow my business sense because I never wanted to be a business owner. And I never really owned that business owner mentality until this year. And so realizing that I have the 100% power to be as successful as I want to be, yep. but I have to get the skills to do it. Yep. So surround yourself with people that have those skills, whether they're books or coaches or whatever it is. So for me, that's really where it's at right now is just increasing my business sense, um, increasing my financial knowledge and my financial sense, mm -hmm. keeping the mindset um, in my pocket because that's yep. where it all starts for me. And that's it's always a part of it. But what I realized is that I had become so comfortable with being authentic. I'd become mm -hmm. so comfortable with sharing my story that when I would try to grow my business, I would fall back into this let's talk about authenticity thing and I would go back into that hole. And so this is where people can look at you and say you're living a courageous life, but you're the only one that gets to decide whether you're actually living a courageous life. Yep. Um, so that's really important. I love it. I love it. So that's that's like the perfect wrap up. Let's like keep driving that home as far as what you really want people to, to take away from this conversation and take action on, Amber. So as far as taking away from this conversation, I really just want people to sit down and try um, to define what your life looks like. If you don't feel like your life is headed in the direction that you want it to go, um, sit down and try to define that. Also, the number one thing that somebody can do, in my opinion, to help move that along mm -hmm. is to start taking 100% complete control over everything in your life. Everything that happens to you is your responsibility, might not have been your fault. And as soon as you start being at cause for everything that happens to you, instead of blaming um, things like traffic or kids or weather, or whatever it is that you blame for things that happen in your life, mm -hmm. then you start putting yourself in situations to be successful. Um, being able to just take a deep breath, um, be authentic and real, being able to have hard conversations with people when you realize that you're doing things that are incongruent with who you are and what you want and you're doing them to please other people. Mm -hmm. um, those are hard conversations to have, but they're so important. Yep. Um, if you want more information on this, obviously, as far as action steps are concerned, you can check out my podcast. We talk about that a ton. Yep. You can also join my Facebook group at More Than Corporate Community, and we dig into all of that as well. Mm -hmm. um, but if this idea is something that intrigues you and you want to have a conversation, like I love connecting with people. So reach out to me and let's talk. I love it. I'm putting it in the comments right now. The uh, More Than Corporate Facebook group and check out the um, More Than Corporate podcast. Anyone who's tuning in or listening right now, live or replay, stay connected with Amber. She is just a freaking powerhouse. Amber, I'm, I'm so grateful that we live in the same city and we get to like meet up in person. And, and I'm super, super stoked to just see you blossom, especially in these gifts with NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, helping people to like transform their reality, how they see the world, like such a deep level of transformation and just all the value that you're adding. See so you grow your, your law practice, step into the to the business mogul and uh, you know powerhouse superwoman that you are and uh, just just rock it so I, I'm, I'm really proud of you and and thank you so much for being here and sharing this wisdom your journey it's it's super inspirational of course man i'm super excited that we connected and i'm going to hold you to that improv thing so i'm going get that taken I'm care going. of soon i'm going, yeah, as, soon, going. as soon as we can <laughs> be going. in six within six feet of each other we'll go improv <laughs> i love it i love it amber i appreciate you have a great rest of your day okay Absolutely. Take care, guys.